This program is brought to you by Stanford University. Uh, so the first thing, <clears throat> I'm going to briefly uh, talk about how geothermal energy is sort of captured and utilized today, and then I'd like to uh, share with you the results of a, a sort of 30-year retrospective analysis that we carried out. Uh, it was uh, led by, uh, by myself and a number of others. We had 18 people involved with it, as you'll see, and it was not just an MIT-centric uh, study. And the last part of this has to do with just sharing with you uh, how a, uh, you might think a chemical engineer uh, might be able to make some contributions in this area. And I, I, I've used two examples of current work that we're involved with uh, in my own lab. One has to do with a interesting uh, hybridization idea between solar and geothermal, and the other with uh, <clears throat> deploying uh, a new type of drilling that, that utilizes some of the, uh, the work that we've done in my lab for the past 25 years or so in, in supercritical fluids. And so this is uh, just a slight advertisement uh, to tell you uh, where the diversity of things are in terms of my own activities. Uh, but we basically uh, look at uh, chemical reactions and transport under somewhat extreme conditions of high pressure and relatively high temperatures, you'll see soon, in, in carrying out combustion uh, at high density. But also there are a number of other uh, things that might be facilitated with uh, with supercritical fluids, particularly uh, CO2 water media for chemical synthesis and, and reactions. But I can't share much of that with you today, but I think it'll put the right context of where we're headed. So this is, uh, this is the concept of uh, looking at inner space as opposed to outer space. Almost all of our focus today in renewables uh, is on the uh, external environment up from the surface of the Earth. Interestingly enough, if any of you saw the recent PBS uh, uh, feature with uh, your own governor and a number of other distinguished uh, faculty from, from this area of the country in California. Uh, they were talking about renewables and deployment of renewables and energy efficiency. Not one word mentioned about geothermal. California is the biggest producer of geothermal electricity, if you will, in the world as a single entity and certainly has been a player for many years. So I find that kind of strange. So I'm talking to you about something that you've been already uh, utilizing in a very positive way. But what we're really talking about is uh, taking advantage of the stored thermal energy that's in the crust of the Earth, uh, hopefully in the form of fluids that are accessible and permeability, but if not, uh, certainly in the form of hot rock that might be engineered in a way that we could uh, literally mine the heat out of it. And so the, the context for this is uh, to think about this diagram for a moment, which is uh, a log-log sort of phase diagram. We have to have a little bit of uh, thermodynamics in here. This is what I call the, uh, the Earth's geosphere in terms of pressure and temperature. So this is bars here logarithmically, and uh, <clears throat> temperature here in Kelvin, uh, and giving you an idea if you want a frame of reference. Uh, this point here is the triple point of water, the normal boiling point, and the critical point. And where we carry out normal combustion, uh, both near atmospheric and above atmospheric pressure at extremely high temperatures, but where an awful lot of activity goes on, uh, including uh, the, the region where we have stable gas hydrates, the idea of uh, uh, Thomas Gold, uh, a, another a Cornelian who recently passed away, who used to think of the Earth a little bit differently in terms of uh, this so-called deep hot biosphere. And uh, we, some of you, I'm sure, are familiar with these wonderful uh, subsea smokers uh, and the chemistry and, and interesting uh, behavior. Uh, this is basically a supercritical condition for water at, at this point, and certainly uh, hydrothermal vents are of great interest. When we look at, whoop, this is back one. For those of you who are inclined on the biological side, uh, this little dot on here is where surface life exists on this diagram. And a lot of money is poured into that to keep us alive and to, uh, to deal with fighting off uh, serious disease. Interestingly enough, this entire other domain has very little money put in it in terms of uh, exploring it with respect to research and, and development and even deployment opportunities. So geothermal, if we were to look at the geothermal region broadly on this uh, sort of diagram, that's where it is. 
So we'll have, you'll be seeing this diagram a number of times. Uh, so that's uh, sort of the starting point. This is um, a copy of the cover of this report that we carried out. It was an interesting exercise for me because I got to work with uh, 18 people, several of which were spread all over the world. And we uh, did this over a period of about 15 months, kind of a total immersion. Uh, and it was done at a time when, uh, during the early period of this assessment, <clears throat> the uh, Office of Management and Budget zeroed out the geothermal budget. So we had a terrific opportunity to sort of explain why that might not be a good idea. Uh, but the primary and secondary goals of this, the primary goal is where we started to do this sort of independent and comprehensive retrospective look at the lessons learned and what's happened in the field and what some of the technical challenges are. If this idea of heat mining, EGS, whatever we might want to call it, engineered geothermal or enhanced geothermal systems, could be actually deployed at a, a high enough rate where it would make a difference uh, in U.S. power production. The secondary goal, we never thought that was going to be too important, but it turned out to be just as important as the first because of what was going on in Washington and a, a sort of re-interest, re rekindling of interest in energy. And that was started back in late 2005 and carried out uh, to the beginning of 2007. In fact, the first official public release of this document was at Roland's uh, workshop uh, a, a couple of years ago in January. This was a, a group of uh, the people involved, and the point is here not to necessarily show you the names, but to point out that any kind of project like this is by its very sort of natural composition multidisciplinary. You cannot just look at one part, one discipline, one part of geosciences or, or engineering and say you've got all the people you need. So you'll see assembled in here people who are economists, some who are very familiar with drilling, very familiar with power conversion, uh, as well as with the subsurface science and engineering aspects of it. And the, the report itself uh, was divided up into these pieces, and I'm not going to uh, bore you with all of this, but uh, point out that uh, you're, if you're really interested, uh, you can get this on this website, or you can email me, and we'll make sure you get a copy. We no longer have any uh, hard copies available, but there's a staging of this in a short summary report abstract, extended, abstract, et cetera, that you can get different flavors. But this is what started it, and I think perhaps for this audience it's appropriate. During the, the period of uh, 15 months or so that we worked on this, the total electrical generating capacity of the U.S. made a, no, a big milestone. It made it to a terawatt, a million megawatts of capacity. And there were, in our view, and I think others who've looked at this, a lot of uh, threats that have to do with whether we could continue to supply electricity at this and even higher levels uh, going forward. So if you look at the coal fire capacity, nothing to do with respect to CO2 here, just the current emission standards that we have, that a lot of them are grandfathered, getting older, and, uh, and uh, will have to be dealt with in one way or another in the course of the next 15 to 20 years. Likewise, in the in nuclear area, uh, we've got at least 40,000 megawatts, if not more now, uh, that are beyond even what I consider to be the most generous of, uh, of relicensing procedures. So they're either going to have to be rebuilt, redeployed, or taken out of service, decommissioned. There are a lot of issues associated when we took on this study with natural gas, and they're certainly around now for sure, this idea that we could just transition to natural gas and some natural way and, and have a much better carbon to hydrogen ratio is, is uh, wishful thinking, <clears throat> particularly if we have to become indebted to a group of other countries that don't like us so much either, uh, and moving a lot of LNG around the world. There's still a lot of public resistance to, to uh, expanding nuclear power. We're in California. I could do the same talk in Massachusetts. Uh, it's been very challenging to think about building uh, new power plants. These, of course, would be carbon-free, but there's still lots of concerns about uh, waste and proliferation, for sure. And these so-called new clean coal plants don't come cheaply, and dealing with carbon sequestration uh, brings on a whole set of other issues associated with uh, uncertainty, let's say, and risk uh, uh, going to periods of time that the coal industry and the power industry is just not that good at. Infrastructure improvements, lots of things are going to be needed. I shouldn't have to tell 
this audience uh, too much about that. Uh, but think about geothermal in a slightly different way. As other, a lot of other renewables are interruptible, naturally interruptible. The wind doesn't blow all the time. The sun's not out. If we were going to really replace the kind of capacity that we have now to generate electric power, we are going to need baseload. We're going to need large nuclear power plants or something else that will do this. Geothermal is naturally a baseload dispatchable supply. It has very high uh, capacity factors or availability factors in the, in the low 90s now. Uh, for all the plants that are being built, and it has a good, good track record uh, worldwide. Uh, there, uh, there are lots of sites around the world. This is a snapshot from a few years back. <clears throat> there are countries on here that are certainly developing countries, smaller countries cent in Central America. If you look, for instance, at uh, the Philippines and uh, Indonesia, uh, you'll see a, a fairly rapid uh, increase that's continued in the area of power production. And of course, the US has shown some growth, and that's uh, continuing now. We have a total install capacity, according to our uh, uh, latest uh, GRC bulletin, of, of roughly 11,000 megawatts uh, worldwide. Remember, this is all at high capacity factor now. So it's different than 11,000 megawatts of wind, uh, which would be only maybe at 30% capacity. And if we go a little further, and think about what's under construction, certainly over 11,000. Iceland, a country that has, I'll show you in a moment, has transformed itself completely in a half a century, is doubling its capacity. You might ask, why are they doing that? They haven't doubled their population. They only have 300,000 people. So think about that for a moment. And in the US, there are tremendous uh, uh, growth predictions as to what might happen to uh, the geothermal in the United States. But still, 6,000 megawatts is a long way from a million megawatts. The Icelanders have uh, literally transformed their country in, in a half a century from being totally dependent on fossil fuels to being essentially independent in terms of their electric power supply and all of their heating needs. They supply most of their heat with district heating from geothermal resources, 20% of their electricity, the remainder from hydro. That increase in, in power capacity has come largely as a result of building world-scale aluminum plants. Electro-refining aluminum is a very intensive, energy-intensive process, requires a lot of electricity. So they ship the aluminum ore now to Iceland, uh, refine it under more green conditions, if you will, with a lower carbon footprint than you would if you had used fossil fuel to generate that electricity, and then ship the refined aluminum out. So aluminum ore in, geothermal electricity, to do the conversion and, uh, and refined aluminum that they can sell to the outside. And uh, in addition, they probably are one of the few countries that could, on a very short time scale, evolve its entire transportation system. There's been lots of discussion as to whether they should do this with hydrogen or electric. They could consider maybe a little bit of both. They're looking now at very high temperature geothermal above the critical point of water as an opportunity to be more efficient at generating electric power and using that as perhaps a way to generate hydrogen or certainly to provide enough for their transportation sector. So geothermal, as, as we've looked at, it's been around for a while. Uh, in fact, the Italians are way ahead of the rest of the world on this, producing the first electric power at the beginning of the last century. We're now at 11,000 megawatts, over 10,000 of capacity. We've got a lot of it tied up in direct use and, and more recently uh, geothermal heat pumps, uh, well in excess of 100,000 megawatts or so. Acceptable costs in, in today's energy markets and, and certainly an attractive technology for dispatchable baseload power. So <clears throat> what's the problem? The problem is that we have to depend on nature to provide all of the ingredients that you need to make these geothermal systems work. These are the so-called hydrothermal reservoirs, the ones we have in Iceland and California and Utah uh, and other locations around the world, as I showed you on that map. And nature is not always that kind. Uh, these are the ingredients that we see present in most uh, operational or commercial geothermal systems. We have to have access to high enough temperature rock. The mass of rock has to be there. We've got to have a good connection to it. So a well-connected, a system of wells that's connected to it, the ability to, to circulate water across this mass of rock to extract the energy, 
and it has to last for a sufficiently long time at sufficiently high rates to, uh, to justify this kind of capital investment, a very capital intensive type of energy production system that has all of its fuel costs, if you will, embedded at the front end. And then ultimately you need a, a means of, of utilizing or converting the thermal energy to electricity. This last one is not so hard to do. These others rely on, on what nature has given you. So if you look at this, and this was the, the, uh, the thing that got us motivated in terms of the study itself, was, was there or is there a feasible path from today's hydrothermal systems, these natural systems where we've got now 3,000 megawatts of capacity in the U.S. to what we'll call tomorrow's uh, EGS or enhanced uh, systems, and where did we pick 100,000 megawatts? Well, the idea was, remember, we have a million megawatts, one terawatt of capacity. We said if geothermal is really going to be a player in the U.S., it eventually is going to have to be able to be at least as big as hydro. And if we add all of the conventional hydro and all of our pumped hydro, we have about 100,000 megawatts of capacity, or at least equivalent to all of our nuclear-powered uh, fleet that we have of the 100 or so reactors, and that's also roughly 100,000 uh, megawatts of capacity. So that's where we pick that number. That's one-tenth of the generating capacity we have in the country, and being able to do it, not necessarily saying it would happen, but is there a path that you could envision to get there in a half a century? So it meant you had to look at the resource, you had to look at the technology associated with engineering these systems and compare that with what we know now about hydrothermal systems and what we have learned from 30 years of testing, these so-called EGS type systems. So there are lots of cartoons. I'm showing you an evolution of, of cartoons from a black and white view of the world, uh, maybe some 30 years ago to a more uh, three-dimensional color picture. These are still cartoons. But you can identify the concept of what you're trying to do very nicely, which I think is a, a good feature of geothermal, because you've got these hydrothermal systems operating at sort of a commercial level around the world in these high-grade regions. So if you just say that what we're trying to do with EGS is basically engineer the system by stimulating the, the subsurface environment one way or the other, either hydraulically or proper well placement, to basically emulate or repl replicate the uh, conditions that we have in existing uh, high-grade systems. That's the objective, and it sounds easy uh, and to represent in a, in a sentence or two, but it's a little bit more challenging than that to actually achieve out in the field. This was a graph that I put together because of this sort of constant uh, debate that goes on between today's geothermal and and hopefully what will be the future, that they're often competing with one another for limited funds uh, within the Department of Energy as well as in other, other countries. And uh, in some circles, they, we might be viewed as, as uh, enemies, let's say. And I like to think of this as a continuum. Uh, this is like any other mineral resource. There is a high-grade region. Uh, and in this case, we're depicting that as down in this part of the diagram that would have relatively high permeabilities, and these are admittedly in arbit arbitrary units that might reflect the connectivity of a, of, a, of a reservoir, subsurface reservoir. We'd want it to have high fluid content if it was a natural system, and we'd want it to have a relatively shallow uh, environment, so we'd like a large gradient, a large thermal gradient on average, or geothermal gradient. So the higher the gradient, the higher the connectivity or permeability, and the higher the fluid content, the closer and closer we get to a high-grade commercial system. Interestingly enough, most of the world, as you'll see soon, is not in this region, and it, it spans this entire continuum, which is literally orders of magnitude, if you will, in, in multiple dimensions, taking us to real low-grade conduction-dominated systems through mid- to high-grade conduction-dominated systems, higher gradient, maybe some connectivity and permeability, but not enough to be commercial. So part of this study examined, first of all, the United States. We're not uh, uh, devaluing our other two important states here. They just occupy a lot of room on this graph. So we, they're in the study. Certainly, uh, we were cognizant of the fact that we have a large number of senators from all these uh, states put together. And uh, you don't want to uh, uh, not tell someone like Senator Snow in Maine what, what she might have in her state or I might point out now Senator Tester in Montana, 
what might be in his state, and there is, there's a heck of a lot of, uh, of geothermal potential there that is un, unutilized for sure. All of the activity in the United States right now in power production is essentially in four states, California, Nevada, Utah, and Arizona. And what we'd like to think of a way we could expand this outward. When we uh, settled the United States, we migrated from the east to the west coast. Now we're going to talk about going in the opposite direction. We want to take the technology that uh, exists now and has been so nicely utilized in the west and migrate to the east. Uh, and you, this, these are just horizontal one kilometer thick slices at different depths. This was put together by Dave Blackwell's team, part of our, our group at SMU. <clears throat> There's a number of these that are in the study. For those of you that uh, are good at uh, geography, you'd recognize this is Yellowstone, and that's Yellowstone there. What we're really getting at is that when you go to 10 kilometers, a lot of the country looks like Yellowstone in terms of its temperature distribution. And, Therefore, it would clearly would be a quick, quick calculation, I would think, for most people in this room to say that's going to have a lot of stored energy. We are not proposing going into Yellowstone as a high-grade area. In fact, in our assessment, which I'll show you the results of right now, uh, we clearly eliminated any areas that were protected, of which a lot of them, uh, like Yellowstone and parts of Hawaii, have terrific geothermal potential. These first two bars I'm showing you here, this is... Stored thermal energy now in, in exajoule quantities, so to put this in context, uh, the U.S. uses about 100 exajoules, maybe slightly more than that now, uh, per annum. Uh, that's 10 to the 18th joules, or about 10 to the 15th BTUs, of 10 to the 15th BTUs defined as a quad. So 100 quads or 100 exajoules, roughly the same on this kind of global scaling. Hydrothermal systems, and this again is a log scale here, so 100, if you will, the annual consumption is the baseline on that y-axis. So this is high-grade hydrothermal. These are so-called geopressured systems that also contain uh, dissolved methane. That adds a lot to their, their thermal, uh, stored thermal energy value, but they're also relatively hot and in high pressure. So they have a hydraulic contribution as well as a, uh, as a thermal contribution. But the big players in terms of energy content are the EGS contributions, on, certainly on this log scale. And this is pretty much what the rest of the country looks like once we take away those uh, sort of natural hydrothermal and geopressured systems that we have. These are big numbers. Uh, you shouldn't, when you start to add up all of the uh, stored thermal energy, you have 14 million exajoules. Uh, the difference between this and, and our interruptible renewables is we can get access to this with today's technology, and we can get it any time we need it. We don't have to wait for uh, the surface activity of the sun passing over or the wind to do it or growing biomass. So it has some repository of a massive amount. Now, how much you can get out, and that's the key question, how much could you actually capture technically and ultimately economically and put to use? And uh, it doesn't take much uh, to, to actually try to think about how you'd go about doing this. We use some, some models as a sort of a first, uh, uh, first cut at this, looking at what we think we can extract from existing hydrothermal reservoirs, and then went downward from there. But even in these very conservative pictures, which have nothing to do with economics now, you still have a very, very big number, you know, millions of times or, or 10,000 times the U.S. annual use. We also spend a lot of time looking back in, in history uh, Roland mentioned about my involvement in the early project at Fenton Hill, New Mexico, the Los Alamos team was leading, and that was the first big field project that went on <clears throat> in the so-called hot, dry rock era, now called EGS, the more politically correct uh, term, I guess. And these darker blue boxes are the bigger projects in town. This was put together a couple years ago. We're going to have to look perhaps at newer ones here because uh, of the uh, stimulation package going on in the U.S. There may be another equivalent Fenton Hill. It might be a Coso or Desert Peak or some other uh, spot in the U.S. There's certainly others now in the European uh, theater, if you will, uh, in Germany. And the biggest uh, current project that we have that would be a true sort of called EGS uh, project is at Cooper Basin in Australia. Uh, there were many people, I think 13 or 14 people from Australia at Roland's conference uh, here or workshop that we just had. That would have never happened 
10 years ago, I don't think. Uh, but uh, maybe, maybe there'd be a couple. But uh, So there's a tremendous uh, interest now and in a, in a great partnership between industry and the, <clears throat> the mining uh, interests in, in Australia and the competence they have in that area and the government, both the state and federal governments involved in it. And SALTS has been a, a big project in the, uh, in the European uh, community uh, funded by the EU uh, with uh, its beginnings. Actually, it started at the Rosmanowis site uh, that was a UK project uh, headed by uh, Tony Batchelor and others at the Camborne School of Mines some years back. And important work going on in Japan in, in somewhat smaller systems. So what we tried to do is to look at this and to see what the lessons learned were and where we might go. So to, su to sum this up, <clears throat> rather than trying to bore you here for uh, the many arguments and discussions we had about what are the most critical challenges, I think it's pretty safe to say that <clears throat> the issue of stimulation and developing this well-connected reservoir is probably where most of the, uh, the challenges still are. It's not in converting the thermal energy into electricity. It's not in drilling wells. Uh, it's not necessarily in, uh, in d dealing with uh, how you might uh, deal with the chemistry you might have in these systems. They're all important, uh, but they're not the, the rate limiting uh, uh, issue right now. It's connectivity, making sure that you can connect the system. This is a seismic cloud, a micro seismic event map uh, put back into two dimensions here from the site over in, uh, in Saltz in, in France, the EU project. And you can see, obviously, it's not very well connected, at least with those other two wells. And what we're trying to do is to um, <clears throat> come up with ways that we can reduce the risk and uncertainty and actually create a large connected system that has the scale of a cubic kilometer. So if you look at the scale on these axes here and Im imagine it in three dimensions, these uh, seismic clouds, which we think are representative at least of the hydraulically stimulated region, uh, are on the order of a cubic kilometer. So these are the projects, again, these five projects. There are a bunch of um, uh, technical issues that we think have been settled. Ability to drill, that's not, that's not a problem. Uh, actually, many years ago, we were able to drill in excess of 300 degrees. It may be more of a challenge, certainly is proving to be so for the Icelanders when they go above the critical temperature, which is about 370 or so degrees C. Lots of diagnostics, tremendous improvements in that area, largely driven by oil and gas, and, and certainly continuous geothermal development and hydrothermal systems big volumes, the problem being that we aren't quite there on production rate yet. Uh, we think we have big enough uh, access to the rock volume, but not the production level we need to be at a commercially a viable condition. So <clears throat> commercial production, getting the flow resistance, the thing is we call impedance or low enough or the productivity high enough through the reservoir. Being able to prove that you can do this, not just at one site in the U.S., but at a number of sites, taking uh, information that you're getting from other uh, countries, let's say, where they're doing it, to bring the risk down, to lower the uncertainty so that private capital would be invested in this. And ultimately, you would like to develop the technology to the point where you have lower development costs so you could go after the low grade. So we could bring this to Ithaca or to, to Boston or to New York where the gradients are incredibly low and you'd have to drill deep, uh, and you want to do that at low cost. So a lot of this ties to research, and some of that research could be classified as applied rock mechanics, or if you want to look at it as coupled reactive transport in, in complex media, subsurface media, but it has to do with understanding the, the, the thermal, hydraulic, and, and, uh, and stress conditions that you, you have in an environment that is far away from you that you don't have a lot of access to. You've got to get indirect data seismically, or you have to do it in individual well bores, which are literally one-dimensional samples of the three-dimensional world. Uh, understanding how to, to actually have a, a toolkit, if you will, of, of engineering know-how so that you can deal with what nature gives you uh, to make these reservoirs is still a big part of this. The, uh, rock mechanics community and, and the applied geosciences community hasn't been given the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the blank check, so to speak, to work in this area for very long. There was a lot of interest in the 70s and early 80s, and it kind of died off. We see that returning now, and uh, there's some competition out here. The Australians have, have beat us in a number of areas uh, uh, that over the years, and for a country that has only 20 million people, 
uh, and where, where we have 300 million now, uh, you, you might ask the question, why are they able to do this uh, better than we are? But uh, <clears throat> they are making progress and they're creating quite a good example for the U.S. to follow. This is a, a site that's in the uh, central area of, uh, of Australia, sort of between South Australia and Queensland and, and near New South Wales, very high gradient, lots of holes drilled in this area for petroleum gas exploration, uh, but no people. And uh, so they have an infrastructure issue, but they've got the cooperation from the government to do this, so now they're looking at it in terms of the geothermal potential. And I'm going to show you uh, a set of uh, microseismic data. We're looking in plan view now. Again, keep in, in mind here that the scale, <clears throat> this, is, this is one kilometer in this plan view picture, one kilometer, two up to here. So what we're looking at is a map projected of these events that occur <clears throat> over a period of time. The scale down here will actually span several years. And the color, color coding corresponds to that time scale. So this is just plotting those events as they appear. And I don't think you have to be a serious seismologist to figure out that this is a big system. Uh, it's definitely bigger than, than a cubic kilometer. It's easily activated. And if you get to this point in the, in the diagram, you'll see it goes on with a period of a couple of years. Nothing happened. Then they came back and did it again and literally extended the reservoir out uh, from the earlier conditions. So this is extremely optimistic uh, sort of results, uh, positive results that came out of Cooper Basin. And, and I think uh, re, re, uh, reactivated a lot of the interest in being able to do this. So let's move on here. So they're out there testing this system. This is not, this, hopefully California will never look like this uh, around Stanford, but that's what it looks like at Cooper Basin. Uh, so, uh, <clears throat> and they, they can use the power there. There's a lot of, for a small scale demonstration, but ultimately they would have to put in big transmission lines to bring that power to where the people live, which is along the coast. As of last year or so, they were at uh, almost 20 kilograms a second, so they very quickly got there. This is a high pressure system, so they're producing at wellhead pressures uh, at 275 bar and at over 200 degrees C, and they're now reworking that system and drilling new holes in it. When we uh, step back from the technical side and took a look at the economics, uh, you can ask yourself some pretty quick questions. What the DOE w was interested in was getting an assessment of how much it might cost uh, the so-called classic supply curve, where if we talk about getting to 100,000 megawatts, not all EGS electricity would be available at the same cost because the grades are going to vary and technology would develop. So during this early period, uh, we're, which we're putting in just 100 or so megawatts. We're developing the technology and bringing costs down. During the latter part of the period, uh, we're seeing uh, going out into the margins a little bit further away from the very high gradient uh, regions. So we did a parametric sen sensitivity study of this, and I'll share with you a couple of the results because I'm going to talk about uh, just what two of them, <clears throat> two particular areas, drilling costs and surface uh, plant cost, but this was a rather exhaustive look. This is the biggest uh, section of that assessment report on, on economics, and if you're curious about, about it, uh, you, you might want to take a look at the report, but there's big financial issues, there's resource-connected issues, and ultimately uh, it's a trade-off between productivity of the reservoir and drilling wells and the temperature with which you want to uh, utilize this resource to convert it into electricity. So I picked these two. Uh, drilling costs tend to go up very rapidly with depth. This is a semi-log plot of cost versus depth in either meters or feet, millions of dollars here. The blue and green uh, points on here are geothermal wells. The black uh, data, both open squares and closed squares, are oil and gas wells to the same depth, all continental U.S. Uh, data for the oil and gas, but an international uh, collection of, of data normalized uh, uh, for the geothermal system. You can see that pretty much uh, below five kilometers of depth or so, all geothermal wells cost more than oil and gas wells to the same depth. So that red line is what we used in modeling the base case condition, and we looked at sensitivity, and as you'll see, uh, quite a bit more sensitivity beyond that for future work. So back to our idea of how research could help some of this. There's the old uh, geosphere temperature, pressure, temperature diagram. 
And so we have some, uh, we have some expertise, uh, not only in my lab, but other, other places. Uh, you know, how does an engineer who's sitting in a university back in cold Massachusetts figure out that they might be able to do something that would be useful? So these are the two examples that I picked. This is a current project that we have underway uh, that involves the uh, Italian utility, ENEL, but not working in Italy, interestingly enough, working in Nevada. Uh, and they have a now North American branch and uh, are developing geothermal resources in, in that part of the uh, country. And you can imagine that might be a good place for not only geothermal, but also for solar. There might be some synergies here to both increase efficiency and, and lower plant capital cost by tying those two resources together. The other has to do with a new way of looking at drilling, and uh, this has been a, a long interest of mine, uh, and it involves a lot of uh, rather interesting engineering science that I hope to share with you. So let's look first at example one. So this is a solar uh, resource map, and uh, again, uh, <clears throat> if you're the senator from uh, our majority leader from Nevada, uh, Nevada, I guess, I don't know how you pronounce it, but it doesn't matter. Uh, that's Stillwater, where the ENEL holdings are in a current plant. We're looking at that site to consider both a solar uh, geothermal hybrid. This is the existing geothermal plant that ex is at Stillwater. It's a small one. They're thinking of expanding this now and uh, coupling it uh, down the road to a, to a geothermal a solar hybrid, if you will, coupling to a solar thermal system. Uh, Ron DePippo's name you might recognize. He's been in the low temperature geothermal power conversion business for a long time. Uh, and also Ken Nichols uh, are involved with this. They were involved with the initial study, but there are a couple of students on here and a, a good uh, re research engineer, Randy Field, who's been working on this. And we've been looking at thermodynamic synergies. Uh, it turns out that those are the most important first step. Uh, the economics are another issue because when we look at uh, solar thermal collectors, this is like what you can see in Nevada One now and what also existed in, in Southern California at Kramer Junction for many years, these parabolic trough type collectors laid out on the, on the desert floor. Uh, they can get to relatively high temperatures and you can pr in principle utilize those high temperatures uh, in a synergistic way. So this is the old diagram with our geothermal region. And if you look at the solar thermal region under concentrating solar power, conditions, you can see there is a way to extend outward to higher temperatures uh, quite effectively, so there might be a natural uh, sort of thermodynamic marriage of these two. It remains to be seen whether this is be economic, and maybe the next time I come back we could talk about that some more. So here's the second example, and this is an interesting collaborative effort uh, that has to do now with a company that's starting up in California here that was part in part the invention of of Robert Potter, who actually was one of the original founders of the Los Alamos project, <clears throat> and his son, Jared, who are here at this uh, meeting, and uh, other colleagues uh, in the so-called Potter drilling uh, startup. But we, myself, and Chad Augustine, the PhD student working with me, have been focused on the fundamental sort of engineering science of this. But I, I want to tell you why we're interested, first of all. This is a experiment that we did some years ago, a field test actually, up in, uh, up in uh, Barrie, Vermont, <clears throat> at the Rock of Ages uh, Corporation's large quarry there. I, uh, Rock of Ages uh, is an interesting name for a corporation, uh, but uh, it is a big, big granite company. And they had a lot of access to rock that was well characterized, big open quarry wall, face about a, a thousand meters, a thousand feet deep, so we could see uh, what we were drilling through. This is an experiment that was done uh, using thermal spallation in a low density, and this is just a kind of a picture of how this actually happens. These are, <clears throat> this is just a propane oxygen torch. We're impinging it on a surface of a nice granite block here, and if you look carefully enough, you'll see these sparks that are flying back. Those are actually spalls that are being ejected from the surface due to the high thermal stress we're inducing with this high heat flux. And if you want to carry this out, uh, this is a movie here that shows the, exper the uh, field test up in Barry. <clears throat> uh, this is a, uh, when we fully uh, get to the point of re-entering the hole, it's about 180 decibel. It's like a ramjet rocket engine, uh, about Mach 2 coming out of this expanding nozzle. But we're using fuel oil and compressed air as the combustible and, and, uh, and oxidant. 
And we were able to drill, this is incredibly crude technology, uh, certainly not optimized in any way, but three to 10 times faster than rotary drilling with essentially no wear uh, and a perfectly vertical hole as well. And this is all well and good. Spallation drilling has been known for a long time in air-filled holes at low density, but we need to be able to go into deeper environments. And that means we have to get into an area where we'd be combusting in the presence of water. So it led to this rather interesting idea of, of studying hydrothermal flames. This is a picture of a methane or methanol type uh, flame that was uh, done by our colleagues over at ETH in, in Zurich some years back. And this one here is the first time we know of that hydrogen and oxygen were actually combusted at about 250 atmospheres, uh, producing a flame of roughly maybe uh, 2,000 degrees Kelvin or so. And of course, the combustion product is water in this case, which has some desirability to, uh, to go into a, uh, uh, back into a well bore if you're drilling it. So that's the idea, and we're looking pretty carefully right now at how this might affect things. So back to the drilling cost idea is that uh, we think that with this new type of technology, in principle, because there is no wear, and you could essentially have more linear type drilling rather than exponential drilling. Uh, this yellow band represents a, a sort of a target of opportunity, a region of development opportunity. And we looked at a number of uh, scenarios in here that not only involved greater pe penetration, but improved ways of stabilizing and casing the hole and a number of other things, just to explore the impact of that. These were the cases that were examined. Uh, the model itself, which was the red band here, plus or minus 20% in these three cases in the yellow region, just to see their impact. And uh, what you find out is you see the interesting trade-off. This is levelized energy cost for three different scenarios of flow or productivity, where we are right now in Cooper Basin or Sults, and where we think we need to be for a commercially mature system. This is a particular uh, resource, mod modest mid-grade, 60 degrees C per kilometer, and a five kilom kilometer depth. And this dotted line represents sort of today's electricity price for a levelized cost. And the red line is where you might get in a high case feasibility at, in 50 years. So this assumes that we're, we stay at level costs. The red line assumes we inflate significantly from that. So under the levelized uh, lower cost base case, uh, you've got to increase productivity regardless of what you do with drilling. But under the higher cost scenario, you could actually uh, do a significant amount with lower productivity uh, by just improving on the drilling. And again, you can represent this in different areas. So just again, put this, this would be California in the west, high grade, high gradient areas. This is the east. And so you can see the uh, emphasis, let's say, placed on improving drilling and, and improving productivity to make this feasible for the entire country. Other supply curves were generated in, in the study, and uh, uh, I'll share some of that with you. But uh, again, <clears throat> this is meant to be not an absolute number, but a way to show a path uh, to get to 100,000. And, and in both cases, whether we have to live with current costs and a, a low case for, for uh, price inflation of electricity, you can get there. So what we're talking about in simple terms is the country Again, this is a slightly different uh, scale using uh, Blackwell and Maria Richards' uh, plot here at six kilometers, not 10, six kilometers. And virtually every part of the continental U.S. and certainly Alaska or Hawaii, if we wanted to look at those two states, is viable at six kilometers if we can produce these EGS-type uh, systems in, in a way that emulates these hydrothermal environments. So that should be a big positive thing, you would think, for the country to think about when it's looking at options. There are a lot of environmental, uh, both positive and negatives, about geothermal. And the ones that uh, people typically focus on are water use, uh, induced seismicity, and, and, and whether they're adaptable, if you will, for a variety of end uses, which certainly geothermal fits. Induced seismicity is an issue. You've got to deal with it. But uh, it's definitely manageable, and it's got to be monitored in any case. What's interesting is that water use requires effective control and management, but it's not a showstopper for geothermal. And the fact that you're producing zero emissions, or essentially zero emissions with no carbon, is a big plus. And most importantly, in trading off against other renewables, it has a small footprint. So this is an example of a, 
a new uh, plan in, in Nevada that uses no water at all, all dry cooling, total reinjection of the geothermal fluid. Uh, so it can certainly live in an environment where water is precious. This was a, a figure a table out of the uh, uh, assessment and shows that comparison between geothermal plants in terms of their net footprint, not their carbon footprint, their net footprint of the whole fuel cycle and conversion cycle, and geothermal looks very attractive in terms of land use, either on a per unit power basis or a per unit electrical energy basis. In terms of carbon, because of the scalability of what we're looking at uh, and the fact that it's base load at high availability factor, the impact that it might have on reducing uh, carbon emissions is quite significant. Uh, these are three different scenarios we looked at. Uh, first, the current uh, projections of, of EIA uh, or current data on EIA 2006, projections to 2030, and then a, an extrapolation of where we might be. The red bars are business as usual. The various blue and green bars represent different levels of penetration of, of EGS. So we're at the end, thank goodness. And um, I just want to summarize a couple things that I hope you take away from this. One is this is not a small resource. It's not going to be limited in utilization because of the size of it or the accessibility of it. That's very different than biomass. Uh, if you want to look for a contrast. It's also different uh, from solar and geothermal, but I think actually complements all of those. So it fits in this portfolio of what we should be talking about. So when we hear the next NOVA presentation or PBS presentation or perhaps the next uh, speech about energy, that geothermal would be not only mentioned, but mentioned in a very complementary way because I think we, we need it if we're going to get to a renewable future. Scalable and relatively environmentally friendly for sure. The carbon-free feature is a plus and the modularity makes it uh, attractive at small scale, few megawatts as well as large scale, thousands of megawatts. Uh, the, the ability to get there technically looks well within reach. We're talking about improving inner well connectivity to commercial production rates and we're only a factor two or three too low. The economic projections are very favorable for high grade areas as I showed you, but a lot more work has to be done uh, to low grade, but there's a credible path to get there. And deployment costs, this is an interesting feature of this. The, uh, the DOE uh, asked us to take a look at long-term deployment and what this might cost. What would it cost the country if you wanted to invest in this? Well, you add all of this up and you come up with a, of the order of about a billion dollars. And uh, that's the research as well as the deployment assistance at the front end where you need to buy down those uh, costs. So the path we recommended was invest a billion dollars, but don't do it. This isn't over each year. It's total over maybe 10 or 15 years. And you support a, 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 a multiple approach of research, field development, multiple sites, and getting active in the resource assessment area to bring risk down. All of this is less than the price of one clean coal plant, one clean coal plant, not the many we might need to actually prove this technology. You'd think that it would be not only affordable. Thank you and read our report, and uh, a lot of people helped out with this. Oh, hit the lights, that's what you want, lights. Um, we have time for a few uh, questions. I, before we go into questions, those of you who need to leave, I want to remind you there will be a uh, Matt Energy Social in the week. Questions? So, I was wondering, um, you talked mostly about commercial scale geothermal, but where does say residential scale geothermal ah, come in? Very good question, right. This, this study that we looked at was driven by the electrical goals, if you will, but at the lower scale, let's call it the smaller scale, geothermal heat pumps, I mentioned a few of those in, in passing, that's a big player. And integrating that into good building design uh, particularly to lower the, the footprint, if you will, the electrical loads or the fuel heating loads of a large building, an individual home, or a place like Stanford, <laughs> uh, or Cornell for that matter, is a good idea. The coefficient of performance of these geothermal heat pumps are very high, typically four or higher, so four units of heat or cooling for one unit of electricity, that's a, a good deal if you can do that, and, and air-to-air systems can't achieve that, certainly not in California in the summertime, nor uh, can they achieve that in the wintertime in the, in the colder regions of the country. So I'm, uh, that was not part of our study. We wanted to look at that, and we're certainly urging 
the government to take a careful look at direct use for lower temperatures, lower enthalpy systems, perhaps more easily deployed in the east right now, and heat pumps. Yeah. Do you think the proper balance should be between the public and the private sector in development geothermal? Well, we have this uh, spectrum of grades, this continuum, right? So if you and I wanted to do a high-grade geothermal system right now, and we knew where we wanted to put it, let's say in Nevada or, or Utah or something like that, we drilled a couple of wells, we could probably, except for the few months we've had a bad economics here, we could probably go out and get a loan to do that. So we could raise money, both venture capital money, debt money for the power plant, and uh, perhaps, you know, build our own power plant. Uh, but if we wanted to do it at the other end of that continuum, in the lower grade areas or the areas that need stimulation, our view, at least the panel's view, and I think it's still pretty much the case, that that would not be carried by industry. That would have to, at least in the early years, that early deployment period, would have to be essentially completely funded uh, by the federal and state governments, but with an increasing amount of cost shared as you went out. But not the first or two or three of them, that's for sure. And I think that's been historically the case if we look at what happened in the U.S., yeah. Of, of the $800 billion that the, the Senate is going to throw at us, and uh, considering the campaign promises that uh, energy will be number one or number two, there's $40 billion for energy now. Billion. Is there $1 billion for your project? Uh, not that I know of, but, okay, let's be optimistic about this, okay? Uh, there are a lot of good things that should be done right now with respect to efficiency. We cannot do this with any singular approach to energy supply. Uh, what I was pointing out early on in sort of a half-kidding uh, manner is that I think that perhaps geothermal has been lost somehow. You know, it's been associated with a sort of too local, too small to make a difference. So we'll just focus on solar, biomass, and wind. And I think that's missing an opportunity. But to suggest that we should just pour immediately, uh, you know, all of the resources into this is equally, you know, sort of uh, <laughs> too, too parochial, I would say. Uh, but I, I think, frankly, we just need a sensible policy, you know. And it seems to me that uh, the state of California and the western states can lead this, you know, sort of migration, if you will, for a while because there's such high-grade resources here that could be done closer to commercial viability. But eventually, uh, for the good of the country in some ways, you'd want to invest in developing that technology, or at least find out whether it could be done and, and whether it could be done in a commercial fashion. And I, I think that's a pretty good benefit to cost ratio of investment. Uh, I know what we're going to have to invest in carbon capture and sequestration to prove that at scale, and uh, that kind of scares me, even though it's, it's got some great geoscience in it that you, know, you could fund a lot of research for a long time. But, it doesn't seem like a sort of permanent solution to me. You know, it seems, it seems like a, trans, a transitionary uh, solution that we may have to do and may have to do in a serious way. So this is one of those. Take two more questions. Yeah. One hand and then one other hand. So being that this is Stanford and money is no object, and you say that this <laughs> Used to be no object, right. Yeah. Only Harvard is left, right? <laughs> right. For, for the sake of the question. Right. Uh, and that you can claim that it's commercially viable and it can go to a, a, a good site. Okay, so how much, how big, how much power do you generate and for how long? Okay so, at, at a, okay, so again, we have history here on our site because we have historical data going back over a century in terms of productivity. The answer is it depends, right, on one, how kind nature has been to you and how well you understand that subsurface environment. But there are wells in New Zealand and, and, and in Lardarello and even U.S. wells that have lasted a long time. There's some that have not lasted very long at all. But uh, so I think as we begin to, to learn about that subsurface system, as we drill more holes into it and produce it, you can get pretty good at predicting uh, whether you can get to commercially viable conditions. Just the thing we were talking about, we could have some production history and go out and borrow money to, to build the plant. If you did that for these natural systems, you can add a lot of power in the country. Maybe in the long run, you could get to perhaps, you know, even that 100,000 figure if you were lucky, but it would not be ubiquitous to the United States. It would be localized in the West. And I think where we have, you know, there are a few people living on the East Coast as well as the West. So to me, 
if you have a technology that could have base load capacity on the east, you might as well work on that part of the problem too. Maybe not putting all of the money in it, but so. But let's just take the range. Let's just yeah. take a, a range of now that we've got the history and we're here in Utah, California, Arizona, what are we likely to need to invest to get a certain amount of power out and for how long? Okay, the two, uh, and for, the, for this kind of development period, the two bills that were, that actually did get authorized, both the House bill and the Senate bill and the convergence of those last year, were recommending uh, uh, an investment of water. This is for total geothermal, including so I'm, EG. I'm talking about one, we're talking about one. One site? Yeah, one site. Well, you know, how big will it, how many megawatts will it be? Let's well, that's what I'm asking. Com comparable to a coal plant, just so. Okay, so, so, so 1,000 megawatts or so. And uh, so you would not build one geothermal plant for that. You'd build module, just like the Geysers field, which was well over 2,000 in its heyday, okay? So you'd build modular plants at the size of 50 to 100 megawatts. Each one, and so that's 50 to 100,000 kilowatts. Each one of those would come in, depending on the grade of the resource, of, of the range of four to $5,000 a kilowatt. Now, you might think that's a lot, but there are two things to think about. One, there's no fuel cost. I mean, it's embedded right there in the drilling cost. And that has base load capacity. So it's not like a solar system where you've got a small fraction of, it's not peak kilowatts we're talking about. We're talking about kilowatts 24 seven. And so that's, so that gets to these levelized figures I showed you of five to seven cents per kilowatt hour. It uses a very high uh, equity rate of return on the subsurface system, 17% per annum and a, a more common debt interest rate for the surface system, the power plant, which would be more traditional type technology. So we think those are fair, but if you don't like them, if you look at the study, you can get any number you want because sensitivity, full sensitivity analysis is run. So you can, you can actually pick your conditions and get the answer to your question. You know, you pick your resource condition. Okay, last question, is this is the one, please. Um. How does uh, the cost and efficiency of a dry organic hybrid compare with like flash steam technologies? Uh, depends on temperature again. So flash flash steam, uh, there there are a lot of flash steam plants that are around, both single and multi-stage. The multi-stage plants uh, operating at say temperatures of 200 plus degrees centigrade, okay, are pretty efficient. Uh, but they would not be, they, they still have that limit of the 200 or 250 centigrade. When we talk about a solar geothermal hybrid, we're going to go up above the critical point, if you will, of, of water. Uh, so we'll be up in the range of maybe 400 degrees centigrade. So the thermodynamic availability or so-called exergy is much higher. So we can produce more power per, yet, per net unit of fluid. The, the more important question, so I think the thermodynamics will be all right. But the more critical question is how much does it cost <laughs> per kilowatt? And it, it, it turns out these solar plants are pretty expensive. Uh, so something is going to have to happen there uh, as well as the geothermal side of this. So I guess I'm optimistic that uh, there's a, a pathway there, but we have to have the solar thermal guys bringing costs down simultaneously with the geothermal people to make it competitive with a lower temperature geothermal plant. All right, great. Thanks very much. Yeah, thanks. <laughs>